It's a great pleasure for me to be here. My second time in Yash, certainly not my last time. Um, always a pleasure to meet all those people that I often see in Brussels or in other meetings all over Europe that work here in the regional textile and fashion cluster at the universities and in the, in the, in the companies and so on to meet them at home, so to speak. So great pleasure for me. Um, also great pleasure for me to assist the very final project event of TCBL. I still remember the first conversation I had about TCBL with uh, your project officer, John Kleuren. I think John is not in the room yet, but uh, I think he's uh, arriving later today. And he said to me, look, this project I've never seen something like that in my life before, and he has been managing many European projects. He said it's, it's coordinated by a municipality. It has a huge chunk of a budget which is not yet allocated to anybody. <laughs> and uh, there are all these strange partners in there that are not researchers, they're not scientists, they're not technology developers. They're all sorts of organizations that I've never heard of. That will be a mess. And, well, you can call it a mess, but it's a much nicer term for that, which is called an ecosystem. And I think that's what also the fashion sector, the fashion industry is. It's an ecosystem that looks very messy when you look at it, but it's like a natural ecosystem. Everything in that ecosystem has its role and has its place and has its meaning. And I think that's also what TCBL showed. And I think, from what I have seen, um, I have not seen myself a European research project that had so many creative people involved, that had so many businesses and small businesses involved in some form or shape. So, and I think this final event is, is again an example of this, both from the program but also from the attendance, how this project reached out into that messy ecosystem of fashion, how it has touched so many people and so many players in, this, in that ecosystem. And that I think is really a pleasure to see. So what I will try to bring you now, and I think I have 15 minutes and I already used five of them, um, a bit of a helicopter view from Brussels on this sector and on innovation and, and technology that is affecting this sector. So let's jump right into that. Uh, I don't need to say much more about that. Uh, Cathy already introduced myself, so I'm the Secretary General of the European Textile Technology Platform, which is a research and innovation network for textiles and clothing uh, based in Brussels and which brings together industry, researchers, academics, um, and all sorts of uh, other technology-oriented um, and science-oriented uh, people related to textiles. Not so many creatives yet, but uh, I, we hope that it will, this will change. Um, let's have first a look at the, at the industry, the industry at the European level. What are we talking about when you talk about the textile and the clothing industry? Well, these are the naked figures. So um, we look at an industry that is very large, um, that is uh, what we always call it, a strategic industry for Europe. Um, we have about 180 billion, close to 180 billion in, um, in turnover, and I hope it will come back soon, um, which um, is an industry that has, um, that has still about 1.7 million employees, so uh, there's still a lot of people uh, working every day in this industry. And that figure has been, to the surprise of many people, quite stable over the last five years. This figure hasn't changed, which is quite surprising because for the last 20, 30 years before, that figure only went in one direction, which was down. So something has changed in this industry in the last few years, uh, which made it stabilize in some way and, um, and I think that's a bit of uh, what I will try to, to, to bring to light in, 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 in my next slide, why this stabilization and maybe actually some growth is, is here and is here to stay. Uh, very interestingly also is the last figure on that slide. Let's see if the pointer works. Yes, this graph here, uh, which is the highest growth of all those, which is our exports. Exports from the EU to the rest of the world, 50 billion euros. So that is a figure that is really significant. Um, that's about a third of the whole industry turnover that is exported outside Europe, which shows how competitive uh, this industry is on the, on the global level. 
Um, here are a few quick figures in terms of the main countries. So, and you always see the greenish part, part is the textile part and the yellow is the, is the clothing part. So Italy, uh, by far the, uh, the largest. Here we're talking turnover, followed by Germany, France, UK. If you go down, Romania's in ninth place um, with a relatively, well, heavier in clothing, but still quite a bit of textile activity as well. Now, if you slip to employment, then you see Romania's in second place. So Romania is still the second biggest employer in the textile and clothing sector in Europe. Obviously, uh, more employment on the clothing side, which we all know is more labor intensive, um, but nevertheless also uh, quite a bit of uh, employment also in the textile sector. Um, here, if you look at, um, and that's one of the elements uh, that I would like to, to mention why this industry is actually much more resilient than what many people believe or want to give it, is its diversification. So here you look at the different subsectors of this industry uh, and its evolution over time. You see 2005 in the middle and 2017, the latest available year for this kind of, uh, uh, these kind of figures. Um, you see that, um, well, first of all, you see all these subsectors uh, of, the, of the industry, but you also see that, well, we haven't seen a lot of change in that, relatively speaking. Yes, we lost a little bit uh, on the spinning, the weaving and the finishing side. We also lost a little bit on the, on the garment making side. So the only thing that really changed quite significantly is, uh, is this part here which is called other textiles, or uh, uh, what we usually refer to as technical or industrial textiles. So this is the share of the industry that has been growing quite significantly over the last uh, 10, 15 years. But overall, still a very diversified industry, uh, being active in many different markets and many different uh, sectors and activities. So that's part of the this story of, uh, of resilience that I, um, that I mentioned before. My next slide, I believe, although I can't see it, yes, uh, was about the long-term evolution. And I really would like you to see that slide because for me that is the best picture to explain what happened in this industry in the last, what is it now, 15 years? 14, 15 years, starting in 2004. Why 2004? Because 2004 was the last year when this industry was still protected, so to speak. Um, by the quota system. On the 1st of January 2005, the quota system for textiles and clothing imports into Europe was completely abolished. So it was free market, it was fully liberalized, and everybody believed at that moment that will be the death knell for this industry. This industry will be decimated and disappear from Europe within a matter of a few years. Well, obviously we all know today this is not what has happened. And what you see here is there's, there's three graphs that are important to show. So you have here the dotted line is the turnover. And yes, our turnover is a bit lower, about 15, 17% lower than when we started back in 2004. Um, but we have, as I mentioned before, the export figures. So these are relatively speaking. So these are percentages. So at that time in 2004, 85% of our industry was internal market, was EU market focused. And whenever the EU market, the consumer market was doing well, the industry was doing well. Whenever the EU consumer, so to speak, struggled, the industry struggled. And this has completely changed. It has changed for two reasons. I mentioned already that there is a big part of what, what our industry does today, notably technical and industrial textiles, that are not directly linked to consumer markets. And there is this big and growing part related to exports. So even if the EU market does not, the consumer market does not grow very much, there are outside EU markets that are interesting growth driver for this industry. Now we're standing at close to 30% of, um, of export quota. So these 50 billion are about 30% of our annual turnover that are exported to countries outside the EU. And these are exported to a very wide variety of countries. Yes, we export to our near neighbors, to countries like Switzerland, to countries like Norway, but we also export to countries like Russia, of course, 
We export to countries like Turkey. We export a lot to the US, our biggest export market. And we're exporting also a lot to China. And that is growing very fast. So, and that is really one of the stories behind the resilience of this industry. So what you see basically here, and that to me is the, is the important graph, is the red line here, which is the value added per employee. The industry increases value added by employees, uh, per employee by over 40% in that time period. So if you want, this industry went through a very brutal gym and its fitness level today is much, much higher than it was back in 2004. And that is what gives me a lot of hope and a lot of uh, positive um, uh, feelings for that industry in the long term. In the long term, the future is that what I was asked to, to, to speak about a bit here. And that's where I refer to the work that we do in the European Textile Technology Platform. And um, I bring you a few, a few points here from our strategic innovation research agenda that we put together back in 2016 and which is still very much valid today. So at that time, we identified four main innovation trends that we see impacting this industry in the coming years and decades. The first one is very much focusing on those um, uh, more technical, more industrial and market applications for which the industry produces smart, high performance, lightweight materials, whether it's construction, whether it's automotive, whether it's aerospace, whether it's medical, that's where a lot of these smart and high performance materials go. Then we have the whole trend of digitization from the factory to the supply chain, all the way to the end consumer which also is linked to new business models, and that's very much what TCBL is all about. Then we have sustainability, circular economy, resource efficiency uh, as a very, very important trend. And then uh, solutions for those attractive growth markets, both geographically speaking, but also in terms of sectors and end applications where textiles and textile materials become, as we say, the material of choice. So let's focus uh, a little bit on these trends that uh, we see also playing out more long term and that I think uh, link very well with the keywords that you have also in TCBL, the circular, transparent, human and digital. So um, I'll go through all three of them uh, in, a, in a moment. So digitization or digitalization as some people prefer to say. Um, will transform this industry quite dramatically over the next few years. It will be very fast and we see it already happening today, mostly at the consumer side, but it will also transform this industry quite dramatically along the, old, the whole manufacturing value chain. So we will have, uh, we will see an industry and a supply chain that is much more transparent in the future, much more traceable, all the way from the material to the end consumer. We will have an industry that will use a lot of virtual design and prototyping, thereby shortening the process of the, from the concept to the end, to end product, also involving the consumer uh, into that process and cutting a lot of waste and lost time in this process. Everybody who is in the business of designing and prototyping today knows how much time and how much material you waste in that process before you get it right. Then digital will also affect manufacturing. We talk about digital factories or digital micro factories that may be very close to the point of, of, uh, of end consumption in cities, uh, in, inside shops. Um, E-commerce, mobile commerce, digital platforms, and the whole idea of interacting with consumers in a digital, in a virtual way will transform this industry quite a lot. And e-learning, which is also something uh, that is very important um, uh, for the industry um, and also for consumers. Sustainability. Um, it starts, of course, with the materials. So we will see over time um, a move towards more natural and more bio-based fibers or renewable fibers. We will also see recycling. We will see more recycling at industrial scale, but we'll also balance between what is called the industrial cycle and the biological cycle. 
So a lot of our products may also very safely return to the biological cycle, will be composted in a safe way. So it doesn't always have to be industrial recycling. And our products will be designed for being recycled. Uh, then we have more, um, uh, we have to green the chemistry that we use in our, in our industry and there's a lot of chemistry use. Um, and since detox, we know that uh, a lot of people are watching us um, more than uh, before. Um, and there will be a whole uh, uh, focus on decarbonizing both the production, but also the consumption stages uh, of this industry. Um, and all, a lot of that will be driven by consumers, but also a lot of that will be driven by regulators and, uh, and standards. So that uh, will be a, a very, very important driver. And then the last point, uh, which more relates to the business models, is um, to turn this industry, which is very much a product industry, into much more of a service industry. Because when you think about, especially clothing, Clothing is so personal. Why are we not providing much more personalized services around this wonderful product of, of clothing and fashion? And when you do that, you can also bring subscri subscription business models. Um, you bring personalized services that we were used to in the past, or at least the people who could afford uh, tailoring style advice was something that was available to the rich in the past. We see that being democratized through new technologies. Rental and sharing services. It's a common practice in professional textiles and clothing. So workwear, protective clothing is a rental business. Users don't own these. I think we see a lot. We will see a lot of that also in consumer businesses coming. And with that, if we see those rental businesses, we also these rental businesses look at product quality and product durability in a completely different way. Because for them, the longer a product lasts and can be used, the more money they will make, and they will make sure that those businesses will be durable. They will be repairable and they will be reusable to some extent as well. And when you talk about services, then especially consumer service, you have to think about the efficient last mile logistics, um, which you have to sort out if you want to be efficient. So if I want to bring it all together, um, we have the sustainability driver, we have the digital driver, and then the service or the, the customer or the consumer drivers. So they all, of course, somehow interact. And we already see a lot of businesses that are active around these interactions. But many of those businesses or innovations that we see today, they are not yet where they should be. We see sustainability and digital somehow mixing up, but not meeting what the customer wants. So you see business models that are not economically viable. You have, on the other side, um, you see interesting concepts of sustainability that are close to the consumer, but they're not scalable. They're artisanal. So they're not industrially viable, so to speak. And then you have also these examples here, of which we see many today, digital platforms that are selling all sorts of stuff to the consumer, but not in the most sustainable way. If you think about the returns of all those digital platforms and how much um, energy and emissions are related in those inefficient logistics. So we are not yet there. So where we need to go is here, where all three elements combine. We have dents where real disruptive innovation in this industry will happen, where we have business models that are loved by the consumer, that are sustainable, and, 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 and viable for the industry and they're also loved by the regulators. So that's where uh, we have to target and where we'll see a lot of innovation moving. So some of those innovators that we have here or here or here will over time move into the, into the center there. So that's where I will stop today. I would like to thank you for your attention. I see, Jesse, I was a bit too late with my last uh, sending to you. 
It was one slide that I, that I added to it, but only this morning, so that was a bit too short notice. That I wanted to tell you also about a new project that we have just started, which is called SmartX, which is similar to TCBL, a cascading funding project, where the European Commission has handed to us, to a consortium of 13 partners, a budget to finance SMEs and startups in the area of smart textiles. So we will have money for 40 projects, um, focusing on manufacturing of smart textiles, so combining textile materials or textile products with microelectronics, with sensors, with actuators, with, with conductive um, uh, materials and so on, for applications in protection, sports, health and industrial markets. We launched our first call in November this year and you can find more about that if you go to smartex-europe.eu um, or you just go to our website here, Techstar Platform, and you'll find all the information. Thank you very much, and sorry for being a little bit over time. Thank you.